and uh, welcome to each of you. And I especially want to personally thank you for your support of Strong Tower Radio. I noticed that the First Flint Seventh-day Adventist Church is very generous in their support of the up-and-coming new station that's being developed in Owasso. And I'd like to call on our AV team to pull up the first of two slides that I'd like to share with you. And you see there pictured our current coverage footprint in the state of Michigan. There are 14 stations, 13 FM and 1 AM. And that has been since 2009 when we started broadcasting from one station in Cadillac, Michigan. Now, if our AV team will click on the next slide section, you'll notice a number of yellow coverage areas, including one that reaches to Flint. These are, let's see, six new coverage areas, make that seven new coverage areas, that are being developed. And the Lord gave us this opportunity to apply for these in 2021. And as you know, particularly with the focus on the great controversy, this Sabbath school quarter, we're in a war, not a war of missiles and bombs and bullets and so forth, carnal weapons, but spiritual weapons. And it's Christ and his agents and Satan and his agents battling out for the souls of every living being on earth. And so as we seek to and move forward with expanding the coverage of Strong Tower Radio, there are quite a number of obstacles that we have encountered and by God's grace continue to overcome. And if you'll click on the next section of the slide, you'll see where there was an exchange for one of the coverage areas in the Upper Peninsula. We have an existing station, WUPJ, that it's a 100,000 watt signal and it covers quite a large area. Well, we have an opportunity and been approved by the FCC to move the antenna from the tower that it's on at about 250 feet to a tower that's much taller. They have openings at 600 and 900 feet. And that provides the coverage you see there in the green, kind of a green hue. And a f about a month and a half ago, we finally received word because Back in 2021, the ownership said, yes, you can have a spot on our tower. So we applied for it, the FCC approved it, and then we realized, well, wait a minute. When we move, we're gonna leave behind about 15 to 20 miles of coverage area, and Lord, we don't wanna leave that area behind. We want that covered too. So what would you have us do to cover the area that would be uncovered if we moved as, and also increase our coverage to the north? And a year goes by and we're wrestling with different options and then the Lord brings about a telephone call and an email from a entity who had been granted a coverage, a license, or excuse me, a construction permit for coverage in Iron Mountain, which reached down to the area that we would be letting go if we moved. If our team would click on the next section, it will show that coverage area in red. Just one more click and it should bring forth. There it is. And so, you see, we had applied for coverage in the Iron Mountain area, but another entity had been granted it instead. And a year goes by and they call us and say, we have some struggles internally with our team, health issues, we can't move forward with this construction permit. Would you like to purchase it for our cost? $13,000. That's a lot smaller price tag than going and buying an established station on the market. And so the Lord provided the funds and we are closing on that purchase this week, I believe it is. There's been some back and forth with the fine print and the lawyers, but it's moving forward. Well, 
About the time all that gets squared away, we get notified by the owners of the tower. We'd been asking them, hey, we're ready to move forward. What, what are the details? We need to work out a rental rate, and what are you looking for? Well, they finally got back with us, and they told us, oh, yeah, we want $7 a linear foot. That would be, at 600 feet, over $4,200 a month in rent, and at 900 feet, over 6000 It's like, that won't work. And so this week, I typed up an email to our contacts there, responding to their telling us $7 a linear foot. And I said, you know, we're a small nonprofit, and we currently have an operating budget annually of about $600,000. Would you consider $3 a linear foot? And we received a response just acknowledging that they received the email and they would investigate. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. I guess they have to run it through their, their authority chain and, and see what happens. Well, yesterday afternoon, I don't know what part of the answer this is, because we're praying, and I, I solicit your prayers for this, God's provision for this tower, because it's an amazing opportunity for coverage. But we found out that the owners of the tower, which it's a TV station, they are in the process of being sold to another media company. We don't know if it's a more local, other than their current owners are out of Texas, the ones buying it are from Illinois, so they're at least a little closer geographically. But I don't know if this transfer of ownership is a part of God's answer, or it may be a shut door. And so we pray that the Lord's will is done, and we pray that this is a part of his answer positively to provide us with a better financial rent rate so that we can actually be on that tower and almost double our coverage. And so this is currently the growth footprint that we have here in the state of Michigan. Now, I'll ask for the next and final slide, and that is a more detailed picture of the coverage from the 10,000 watt Owasso station that will reach First Flint, this area, as well as up to Saginaw, over towards Alma, St. John's, and almost down to Lansing. And we have had some challenges here, and we have finally been able to order the transmitter and the antenna. We had to finally go to a place in Italy. Of course, we didn't travel there. We just dealt with them by phone and email. And they're able to actually construct the antenna that will work for this coverage pattern that you see. It's kind of shaped like a kidney bean because certain areas have to be protected from other adjacent signals. The uh, communications area is quite managed by the Federal Communication uh, Committee and Commission. And so our, the manufacturer in Italy has been dealing with some troubles this winter. They've had a lot of storms. The storms have had some fatalities. And their field test area where they have towers, they put these antennas up on towers and test them to make sure that they actually achieve the desired coverage. And so they've been having some delays with the weather that have put set them back, but we're praying that they are finally are now able, they said, to get to their test fields and do these tests so they can ship the antenna to us within the next week or two. The transmitter, which is being manufactured, lo uh, not locally, but domestically, is nearing completion as well. And so we're expecting to receive both of those within the next week or two so that we can then begin constructing on the ground. Once we have everything put together, then we can tell the FCC we've completed the construction permit. Now we're ready for a broadcast license. And the FCC takes about 45 days. They go through everything and review it. And if they don't find anything, which a lot of times they don't, then they issue us an eight-year broadcast license, at which point we can flip the switch and begin broadcasting from the new station, which will be 88.7 FM. 
And so we praise the Lord for his provision, the funds that have been given, and that we're able to move forward with this new station. And again, thank you for your continued support of this radio ministry as it will begin very shortly to reach this region with the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ 24-7, 365 days a year. And what kind of experience will you get to look forward to with that? Well, let me share with you an amazing testimony from our sister church, Sister Tahir, in uh, Kalamazoo. Shortly after WMJC began broadcasting Strong Tower Radio in the Ka Battle Creek, Kalamazoo area, a lady began listening. She had found Strong Tower Radio on her radio dial as she drove to work. And she began listening. She was attending a Lutheran church and she was listening and hearing things she'd never heard before. And she had Bible questions that neither her Baptist church growing when she was growing up in that church nor her Lutheran church were able to answer. And she wanted answers to the Bible questions that she had. And as she's listening to Strong Tower Radio, not only is she receiving answers from the, for these questions, she's also realizing, wait, there are things I didn't even know about the Bible. Wow, I need a church family like this. Well, then COVID hit in force and all the churches shut down. And it was actually, I got two stories mixed up. She started listening after COVID had started because we didn't start broadcasting till July of 2021. And so COVID had been doing its thing for a while and the churches were still, were still shut down in some instances. And she was impressed not to go back to her Lutheran church. No particular answer was provided. She was just impressed not to go there. And she said, Lord, I need a church family. And this went on for a while. She was listening to Strong Tower, learning, and said, I need a church family that keeps the Sabbath. And she was convicted on the Sabbath, number of other things. And so one Friday, one Friday afternoon, she has this amazing and precious habit of talking out loud to the Lord. And she says, Lord, I'm going looking for a church. Are you coming with me? And so she had a plan. She was going to drive around Kalamazoo. And the Lord was going to point, not point, but indicate to her, this is the church I want you to attend. Well, that was her plan. And she drove around for an hour or more. Nothing. Went by so many churches. Not a word. She's like, man, I'm sorry, Lord. I've wasted an hour of your time and this fuel. I'm done. I'm going home. So she turns onto Nichols Road just after saying that. She's like, she's done. She's going home. Well, Nichols Road, if you know Kalamazoo, that's the road on which the Kalamazoo Seventh-day Adventist Church sits. So she's driving down Nichols Road. She's not thinking about, okay, Lord, point me to the right church. She's going home. And as she's driving by Kalamazoo Seventh-day Adventist Church, she says, I don't know what happened. But as I'm passing, all of a sudden, it, everything changed. I didn't see how it happened. It's just I went from driving down the road to I'm behind the church because the parking lot is behind the church, kind of like here. So let's say if we're going to put this situation here, she's driving down Beecher, and all of a sudden, boom, parked in a parking space back here. And she said, she's like, what? Looked down at her gauge to see if there was something weird going on with her car. She said, everything's normal. And then it shuts off. Doesn't stall, it shuts off. And usually when people experience things like this, they do one of two things. They freak out or they start laughing. She took the laughing route. She starts laughing and looking around and then she spots two signs, Kalamazoo Seventh-day Adventist Church and Strong Tower Radio. She'd been listening to Strong Tower Radio. She's looking for a church that keeps the Sabbath, and she just burst into tears. She's like, 
this is where you want me to go to church? And she just had that confirmation, said, I'm coming here tomorrow. And she walked in about 9.15 or so on Sabbath morning, was warmly greeted, started making lots of friends, heard a powerful message and in harmony with the scripture. And she said, wow, this is where I belong. And she's been going there ever since. And just a few years, not years, a few weeks ago, she was baptized into the Kalamazoo Seventh-day Adventist Church. And to illustrate further the power of prayer, because she was praying for guidance. But what she didn't know was that the members of the Kalamazoo Church were praying for a Strong Tower radio listener to come to the church. They said, Lord, all the, so many of these other churches have Strong Tower radio testimonies. Some of them have multiple Strong Tower radio listeners who've walked through the door and joined. We want a Strong Tower radio testimony. We want a Strong Tower radio listener. They had started praying a few weeks before. So you've got all these people praying. And Lord says, I can bring you guys together because when we pray for others, especially for others, it authorizes God to work in a more mighty way on their behalf. Because we, as I mentioned previously, we are in a war. And it's a war for free will beings. And so as we pray, as we uplift someone or many someones to God in prayer, it gives him greater authority to work in their lives because he's not going to kick the door of their heart in. He's going to knock as a considerate, loving Savior and say, may I enter? And as we authorize him to do greater things, things like angelic intervention, let me put your car in the right place right there. You got some driver assist. Those kinds of things happen when God's people pray. When we seek the Lord on behalf of others and when we seek the Lord on behalf of our own spiritual need, it authorizes God to work in a greater way. And so we praise the Lord. That one's an even more dramatic story than, as far as this intervention than when people's radios do interesting things, that's intervention of God as well. When the angels work with the dial and all of a sudden, wait, I can't get my radio off that station. What is this? And so we have, we have testimonies like that. And it's just, it's such a wonder and a blessing to work in a mini with a ministry and to work with you. That's an integral part of working with this ministry to reach people with the everlasting gospel, the full truth as it is in Jesus. And radio is a tool in the hands of God's people to exponentially expand their outreach. It goes to every door, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can't do that by walking door to door. We might reach them once, one door, one, each door one time a decade. And that's if we're really hustling. And radio reaches people every day where they are. And so I have brought some new sharing cards. And these actually have both the existing broadcast stations and the upcoming stations on it. Now, we also have bookmarks, but I didn't bring those because sadly, we did not catch a spelling error on one of the station names. And it's somewhat close to this area. Port Sanilac got misspelled, and it says Port Sanilac. And so we are in the process of correcting that mistake. But meanwhile, we're sharing the, the bookmarks that have the misspelling in other parts of the state that are not as in tune with that misspelling. And so you can find these sharing cards in the back under to the lower right in the cubby there in the foyer. And so again, thank you for your generous support of Strong Tower Radio. 
We look forward to actually broadcasting here very shortly. And before I open the Word of God with you this morning, I would like to, not only like to, I need to go before the Lord in prayer. And so I will use this mic here to do that. Father, we thank you for this time, and I pray that as we open your word, that you will guide my mind and my words, that they be from you, and anoint our ears that we may all hear the message that you have for us this morning on this Sabbath day. We thank you and ask that this message strengthen us for the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. So a lot of you, I'd imagine, are fairly familiar with the solar eclipse that happened earlier this week, and that there was a lot of lead up to it. And it was interesting, it is interesting how we have such an ability to forecast weather and even outer space events like planetary align alignment and its impact on Earth. And we even have some, sadly amongst us, well, I won't say amongst us, but some who claim to be Seventh-day Adventist, who have tapped into this solar eclipse and put some things online that took some spirit of prophecy quotes and made it sound like Nashville might get bombed with fireballs, misusing things that are clearly portrayed as applying to after the close of probation at, as part of the seven last plagues. And, well, they accomplished their goal. They had over 10 million hits. And the sad thing is, well, let me take that back. Number one, it was very good that the eclipse happened with nothing spectacular beyond simply the two bodies passing by one another. No fireballs fell from the sky, none of that. The sad thing is, there are many skeptics who were made by those things that were claimed. Because now you have people using the spirit of prophecy, seeing it may be their first exposure, and they're like, well, pff, that didn't happen, so why should we give anything else from that author any consideration? And this is not a new problem in terms of weather and things happening and understanding what they mean. In our scripture reading today, Jesus said, you have the ability to understand the weather when you see the sky is red in the evening, things will be nice tomorrow. But if it's in the morning and the sky is red, a storm is coming. And he said, you're so good at forecasting the weather, but you don't understand the signs of the times. Not a new problem. We see that today. Our ability to understand and forecast the weather far exceeds what was happening in Jesus' time. We now can look days, even weeks ahead, and no, it isn't always spot on, but we have a good idea of how things we can use radar and have some amazing abilities. And yet the more our ability to forecast the weather increases, the less we, as you could say, a society, understand and appreciate God's word. And mankind is elevated and God is put to the side, almost as if, eh, we don't need that. We've got our own plan. We have our own plan. And the plan often gets threatened by truth. And that's the case we find in the life of Jesus many times. And so we have, well, let's look at this. This was not a new problem. See, 
What did Jesus say at the very end of this morning's reading in Matthew 16, 4? He said, no sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah. Well, in Matthew 16, the sign of Jonah is not really explained. And there's a reason for that. It wasn't a new thing that he'd said. Let's look in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. This had been a repeated matter. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they had asked for signs of who Jesus was. They wanted him to show them on demand something that would cause them, they said, to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yet so many signs had already been given and Jesus was fulfilling hundreds of prophecies before their very eyes. And the very ones who were understood to be experts in the Old Testament, which was the only Bible they had to that point in time, the New Testament was literally being lived out right there to be written shortly thereafter, their expertise did them no good because they were looking through an unsanctified lens and instead of seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of all the promises of the Messiah in Scripture, they were seeing him as a threat to their empire, if you could call it an empire. And so here in Matthew 12, 38, says, certain scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, and there will be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonah was, in the, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then in verse 41, we see another part of this sign of Jonah, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. So what is the message of the sign of Jonah? It's not balls of fire coming out of the sky when an eclipse happens as was portrayed as a possibility leading up to last or this the eclipse earlier this week. No, the sign of Jonah is about resurrection and repentance. We need, what is required for us to be in the first resurrection? We need repentance. And what is required to have resurrection? The power of God. It's actually required for both. The goodness of God leads to repentance. The power of God is required for resurrection. And so these are the true meaning of the sign of Jonah, not some weather event. And similar problem, and God would give them a sign. It wouldn't be one they ask for, though. It would be in his timing and his way, and it would be unmistakable. And that this sign would show the motives of everyone internally out in the open. Let's turn to John chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus. You're probably familiar with it. And so we're going to hit the highlights, not reading all the verses, but we'll start with verse 4 of chapter 11. The setting is that Jesus is several days north of the area around Jerusalem, and he's up past the Sea of Galilee, and he receives a message. Messengers come from Mary and Martha to tell him, Lazarus is, is sick. And notice what it says in verse 4. When Jesus heard, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now think about this. I hadn't thought of this until recently. The messengers come tell Jesus. He tells them this. Oh, that's good. We'll go back to Bethany now. 
this sickness will not result in death. Imagine what they must have experienced when they returned and heard that Lazarus had died. Jesus got it wrong. Lazarus died. He said this was not unto death. Opportunity for doubt. And then, in verse 11, Jesus says, And after these things he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go, that I may wake him out of sleep. And then the next couple of verses, the disciples express their misunderstanding that, oh, Lazarus is sleeping, he'll do well. And Jesus makes it very clear to them what he's talking about. And in the process of that experience teaches us a very important lesson. He says, Lazarus is dead. Death in the first death in the Bible is equated to a sleep. You wake up from a sleep. Everyone will be resurrected. The question is, what resurrection will you be in? The first unto life or the second unto death? It's an important question we each are faced with daily. How we live our life day by day, decisions we make form characters that will determine what resurrection we wake up in. And not that we can accomplish this in our own strength. It is looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and seeking his power, his grace, to live by every word of God. This is the word of God. It is to be our guide in life as the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. And so the disciples were confused and Jesus in clearing up their confusion also helps us today to clear up a confusion of what happens when a person dies. And we'll talk more a little bit about that in a few minutes. And then Jesus says something very interesting. It must have made the disciples really scratch their head because he had said this sickness was not unto death. They heard that. And now he says Lazarus is dead. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. What is Jesus up to? He said, this is not unto death. Two day, couple days later, now he says, Lazarus is dead, and he's glad so that we may believe? Wait, you said he's not going to die, now he's dead, according to what you just said, and you think that's going to build our faith? What is up with that? So you've got the disciples that are just thinking about this, going, what is going on? The folks who took the message back that Lazarus this sickness is not unto death. They come back. Lazarus is dead. What do we do with that? They've got doubt. They're swirling around in their head. Remember, the Pharisees said, this guy works by the power of the devil. Don't believe in him. The Sadducees says there is no, they, there is no resurrection. They didn't believe in it. They didn't believe in a personal God who would raise you up and live with you forever. No, no, no. That didn't fit in their theology. What a hopeless theology that was. And so here they go, down on this two-day journey. And what happens then? They arrive and find out, okay, Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. They had the practice of burying you the day you died. So the day you died, you entered the tomb. He's been in the tomb four days. That means he's been dead four days. So that's consistent. Now... Martha finds out that Jesus is in the area and where he is. And she just, pew, she's going to go talk to him. So here in verses 21 and 22, she talks to him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But then she makes this awesome statement of faith. She says in verse 22, but I know even now, whatever you ask of God, he will give it to you. Do you hear what she just said? 
you can resurrect my brother now. So Jesus hears that and he tests her faith. Notice what he says. Your brother shall rise again, verse 23. Now, she didn't hold on to that power of faith statement. Instead, she went with the more familiar theology that she was used to and said, I know he's going to resurrect in the last day. Even though she wasn't holding on to the now, that's still a principle that's very valuable for us. Because much of the Christian world says, oh, you go right to heaven or hell when you die. It's like, nope. The resurrection is at the last day. No one goes ahead of anyone else. And so Jesus says, I'm going to bring you back to the now. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? It's like, Martha, it's now. Do you believe? And she never answered the question directly. Instead, she says, I believe you are the Messiah who is sent from God. And then she scampers off to go get her sister Mary and tell her where Jesus is so that she can go meet him. And when Mary comes over, now when Martha came, she came by herself. But when Mary comes to see Jesus, all the mourners follow her. And they're making quite a noise in their mourning. And Jesus sees Mary crying. She falls at his feet, says the same thing that Martha did. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother hadn't, wouldn't have died. And he looks and he sees all the mourners. And he just groans in spirit. And I envision that it didn't just, didn't just say groaned in spirit. It said he was also troubled. And I like to visualize things. And I can just see him as he sees this, Mary and all this sea of mourners. And he just inside, he goes, mm, mm. And then he says, where have you laid him? And they go to the tomb, which isn't that far away. And the weeping just intensifies. And yet, are they really mourning for loss? Let's turn to Mark 5, 39. The same word that is used for weeping in John eleven thirty three is also used in Mark 5, 39. And notice what other descriptions come with this word. This is the scene of the... Uh, Jairus's daughter just died, and the mourners are there too. So it's the same situation. You have death and mourning. And in verse 39, when he came in, he said to them, Why do you make this commotion and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleeping. The same word for weeping in John 5, 39 is used for John eleven thirty three. So Jesus here is witnessing what is common still to this day in the Middle East and in other parts of the world where you have people who come and they make an exaggerated noise as a means of thinking to comfort and mourn and express loss for the one who's died in the family. And yet Jesus knew that within this group of mourners, there were many who would plot his death in just a few days. Why did he cry? It says in verse 35 that Jesus wept. He cried for the hopelessness. The people were weeping as those who have no hope. Yet the res all who are faithful can look forward to the res resurrection of life. Why, why mourn as those who have no hope? He cried because he saw the lack of faith in those who were there mourning and pretending to be sad when they would not only plot his death, but the death of the man who was going to be resurrected that they were now saying by their actions they were mourning for. He was crying because of a rebellious, disbelieving people.
Remember, he said, this sickness is not unto death. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that God had called him to resurrect Lazarus. So he wasn't crying for Lazarus. He was crying for those who were unaccepting of truth. But he, couldn't, he wouldn't spend much time in that experience. And neither should we. You know, there is a mourning for the lost. And we are to seek the lost. Yet in our seeking and our mourning, let us not stop working. When there's danger, don't say there's a line in the streets. Or the wind is blowing strongly. I cannot go out. The Lord calls us to go out. Let us do it faithfully. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. And when God is about to do a work, there's so often someone who says, oh, wait, we don't want to do it this way. And what happened with Martha? She was an energetic and positive woman, and she says, oh, no, don't roll away the stone. It's been four days. My brother stinks by now. She didn't want that experience to, that would be embarrassing for the family. And Jesus patiently looks at her and says, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, the ones who were by the tomb, who were able to roll away the stone, they believed. They rolled away the stone. They wanted to see, what is he going to do next? And what he did next is just one of the most amazing things ever. And he doesn't go in a hurry. See, it's the Bible, John, in the end of the Gospel of John, he says, if everything Jesus had done were recorded in books, the world could not contain them. And you look at what has been recorded, and it's so rich with meaning and experience and lessons for us today. And Jesus doesn't just say, Lazarus, come forth. He looks up to the sky and he talks to his heavenly father, just like we can do today. And he says, he's addressing what the Pharisees had said. Because what he's about to do is going to blow the doors off everybody's doubt. And he wants to be sure they understand how it happens. And he says, Father, I know that you hear me always. Back then when they said that it was by the power of the devil, no, that was you. And I didn't say that I'm not talking to you now out loud for my benefit, but for those around me within the sound of my voice so that they may believe that you have sent me. And the unspoken is not only that you have sent me, but that what I'm about to do is by your power. Because in John 5, 19, John 5, 30, John 8, 28, I believe it is, Jesus says, I do nothing and I say nothing, but what I see the Father do and he directs me to say. And the next thing Jesus says is, Lazarus, come over here, come out. And can you just picture, it's as quiet as it can be. And they're listening, what will happen? And then they hear a rustle and a shuffle. Because they've bound Lazarus fairly tight. So he's got to kind of walk like so. And he comes out and stands in the door. I mean, wow. That's got to be a shakeup of everything you have ever learned, seen, or heard. And Jesus says, loose him and let him go. And you know, that is the message of Jesus' ministry from the beginning to the end. Remember what he said when he went back to his hometown of Nazareth and he walks into the synagogue and he volunteers to read the scripture and he opens it up to the first verse of Isaiah chapter 61. It's recorded in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke 4, 18. 
He's given the scripture and it says, he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised or them that are contained in chains, imprisoned. So deliverance to the captives and setting them free. Multiple kinds of captives. Captives to sin captives to fear, captives to lies. He came to set the people free. So what was the response? Verse 4, back to John 11, verses 46 through 53 record the response to the miracle. Many that day believed on him. But in their belief that what he was doing was effective, many, particularly in leadership, realized they were going to do something. It motivated them to go against Jesus even more. Why would that be? The answer is found in verse 48 where they said they met together, the council, the Sadducees, the, Fad, the Pharisees, and they said, if we let Jesus alone, all will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Our place being leaders of Israel, and then they'll just take away the whole nation which when you looked at what Jesus said and taught and how he lived, he was a friend to the Romans. Their accusation, their logic breaks down immediately. But that's not the point. They wanted something more than truth. They wanted their own power. They wanted their own way. And they wanted great influence over others. And if it took killing Jesus, and as chapter 12, verse 10 points out, also Lazarus was on their guns, in, under their gun sights, then so be it. They wanted to preserve it at any cost, even if it meant the lives of others. Do you realize that Jesus predicted this just a couple weeks before it happened? See, in John 13, 19, Jesus says, I tell you these things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you may believe. The whole purpose of prophecy and miracles is to strengthen our faith, to develop and strengthen our faith. So let's look at where Jesus predicted, where he prophesied this event. It's something you'll find in Luke Chapter 16, verses 20 through 31. We won't read the whole account because you're familiar with it. It's the parable of, or the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And you're familiar with it. And the point of this parable is not as many suppose. It's not about what happens when you die. Mm -mm. It's about faith and the fact that if someone were to come back from the dead, it would not change the belief of the people that Jesus was working with at the time. And notice how this works. In verse 30, chapter 16, verse 30, it says, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. The idea was... There was a rich man with five brothers and a poor man, Lazarus. And the poor man, Lazarus, begged, and the rich man never did anything to help him. They both die. And in Greco-Roman thinking, you have a separation between the soul and the body. And so many were familiar with this thinking, and Jesus taps into this to teach them the truth about what happens, how life is given. And he's, the, I, the story was, the rich man says, send Lazarus back to warn my brothers, don't live like I did. 
You can't come back from the dead. You can only be raised from the dead. And you see that in verses 30 and 31. In 30, it says, oh, but if someone would come back from the dead, they will repent. And the response is in verse 31, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. See, Jesus corrects the theological mistake in 31 by saying the only way someone could come back from the dead is through resurrection. And he is the, the resurrection and the life. So he corrects that mistake of understanding, that theological error. Only through the power of God does anyone come back to life. If you ever or someone in your life comes to you and tells you, I had someone come back to me from the dead and tell me whatever they told you, don't believe it. Not that, I'm not saying don't believe that it didn't happen. Don't accept the message that's delivered from this person because it isn't this person from the dead coming back to tell you something. It's a evil angel who is personifying your loved one, trying to gain influence on you to change you from truth to error and using a dramatic platform to do it. The only way life is given is through the resurrecting power of God. The devil can only pretend to give that. And so... What happened in real life a couple weeks after Jesus shared this rich man and Lazarus story? A man named Lazarus is brought back from the dead. And the powerful and wealthy spiritual leaders in Israel did not believe. What did verse 31 say? Though one come raised from the dead, they will not be persuaded. They have Moses and the prophets who point forward to Jesus, yet they didn't believe. Prophecy fulfilled. Now, why would they not believe? As we said, they'll take away what I want. That's the reason so many don't believe. Or that's the reason so many try to bargain with God. Scripture says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. But sometimes we'll take the word of God and say, well, I like a lot of it, but there's some parts of it I just don't like, so I'm not going to follow that part. Well, I'm not smarter than God. I need to follow every word, even the parts that cross my will in a big way, because God does not ask us to pick up or lay down anything that is not intended for our good. Now, what did they ask for? They said, show us a sign. And Jesus said, no sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah the prophet. And yet Jesus, with the direction of the Father, gave a sign that convinced all that he was the real deal but not all believed unto salvation. Others went a different direction and said, no, we will have our own kingdom, our own power. It's a sign that is given to us today that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and is able to give life unto all so I ask you today, friend, do you want Jesus to have his resurrection power in your life to give you victory over all sin right now? 
You see, we hear the statement that sanctification is the work of a lifetime, and it is. But how often we have it portrayed for us as, oh, I'm going to spend my whole life struggling to overcome everything, and at the last minute, I finally get there. I barely cross the finish line. Is that the kind of victory that Jesus offers us? He offers us victory today, and he offers to sustain us in that victory all throughout the rest of our lives. And we will never be the ones to say, I have arrived, just like Paul wrote to the Philippians in verse 3, or chapter 3 of that letter. He says, I don't count myself to have arrived, but I keep pressing on upward to the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. And we are called to that same experience, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and to take hold of his strength. Not my will, but thine be done. Filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever we encounter, he will give us victory. And so there's nothing better than eternal life with Jesus Christ. The power to have that experience he offers today I want that experience. Do you want that experience? Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, you have seen our hands. You know every heart. You know what we're wrestling with. And you have given us such abundant evidence that you are the resurrection and the life. You have the power and are standing by to give us victory today. To give us the joy, your joy as our strength. May we have that experience as we look forward to seeing you very soon, face to face. May we be ready, knowing you by faith now. So as, as 1 John 3 says, when you return and we see you face to face, we will know you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.